Amen. How is everybody doing this evening? It's good to see you guys in the house of the Lord. It's always good to see familiar faces. And uh, it's always an honor and a privilege to be up here leading you in today's study. So today the title of my message is Stewardship. I know that uh, Pastor Vic on Sunday has been doing an amazing job on uh, tithing. And I kind of wanted to keep the theme. So today the, the title is Stewardship. So I wanted to start with the story and then we'll pray before we get started. So it says a father and a small son are traveling on a freeway, and the boy says he's hungry, and he would love to stop for a snack. They see the golden arches ahead, and they pull off the road. Hey, who doesn't love McDonald's, right? But the boy sits at one of the tables in the restaurant, and the father returns with a bag full of steamy, fresh French fries. The boy's face brightens up with delight because he's hungry. The father sets the fries before the boy and takes the seat opposite him as he loves his son and he loves to watch him eat so heartily. The two sit at the table together while the boy munches away at the snack. Then the dad does what all dads do. He reaches over and takes a french fry for himself. And the little boy snaps at his father and he says, dad, these are mine. Why don't you get your own? And the dad thinks about the incident on the long silent drive home. And he's thinking to himself, you know, I gave my son every fry I had, and all I wanted was one. My son doesn't understand something. He doesn't know that I could take all those fries away from him in an instant. Or if I felt it best for him, I could add to the bag of fries so abundantly that he'd be overwhelmed by them. He thinks that they are his. How did he forget who brought them and bought them to him? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, God, today, Lord, for this day, Lord. We thank you, God, for this amazing day, Lord. The Bible says that we should rejoice and be glad in it. So today, Lord, we rejoice, Lord, and today, Lord, and today, Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we come, Lord, as we get into your word, Lord, I pray that you would have already prepared the minds and the hearts of your people, Lord, for what you have for them, Lord. I pray today, Lord, those that are coming today, Lord, looking for something, I pray that you would meet them, Lord, wherever they're at. We love you, and we thank you, and we ask in your son's precious name, amen. So listen, to uncover what the Bible says about stewardship, we have to start with the very first verse of the Bible, right? Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And listen, when you're the creator, you have absolute rights of ownership over all things. So if the Bible says that God created all things, then as the creator, God has absolute rights and ownership of all things. Does everyone agree with me? So listen, if God owns all things, then that means you and I own nothing. Does that make sense? If God is the creator and he has absolute right and ownership over all things, that means you and I own nothing, including our own life. You know, nothing else in the Bible, including the principle of stewardship, it's not going to make any sense to you or have any relevance in your life if you miss this fact. That God is the creator, and he has full rights of ownership to everything. Right? And when we understand that, people say, well, you know, the car I got, I bought. Listen, all the material that your car is made of, God provided it. The metal, the jewelry that you're wearing, God provided it. Right? The house that you live in, the material, the wood, it grew on a tree that God created. There is nothing that you have in your life or will ever have in your life that does not come from God. You're going to have to borrow everything. So in case <clears throat> maybe you disagree with me, I'm going, to, I'm going to point out a couple of verses in the Bible where it iterates. And it says it many times, but I'm just going to give you four verses that say it. Psalms 24.1, it reads this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalms 89.11 says, the heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You form the world and all that is in it. 1 Corinthians 10.26 says, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Revelation 4.11 says, for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. So listen, throughout, throughout all of the Bible, God declares complete ownership over all of his creation. Not some of it, not most of it, but all of it. So what that means is that there are no other owners. God is the only owner. So listen, if you can accept that truth, 
If you can accept the truth and understand and live in the idea that God owns everything and I own nothing, I promise you, your life, you're going to be better off in this life. And the reason I say that is because most people, most people believe that they own what they really don't own just because they have it or because it's accessible to them. Right, so many people think that they own their life, they think they own their family, they think they own their kids, they think they own their home, right? I worked hard for this, I went to school, I educated myself, all of this is mine. That's a misunderstanding, it's not what the Bible says. But instead of being owners, God has created us to manage what he owns, because he owns it all. Right, and it's very typical for owners you know, that own companies that are, that are a significant size, it's very typical that owners have managers, right? Managers to manage uh, their property, to manage their business, to manage their affairs. It's not uncommon that a business person has a manager or multiple managers for that, for that matter. So let's back up. I, I want to back up. Before, before Adam in creation, I want to explain to you how stewardship, the, 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 the beginning of stewardship, you know, before God created us to manage all that he owns, there was another management company. And these, this management that used to manage were called angels. Right? God, God had all of his angels managing all of his, all of his creation until one day one of them, by the name of Lucifer, said, you know what? I'm out of here. He wanted to be as good as God, and uh, obviously that wasn't going to go so God kicks them out of heaven. So let's read right here in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. This is what takes place. It says, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Saphon, and I will ascend above the, upon the, above the tops of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. Right? Isaiah 14 explains how Lucifer, the son of the morning, rebelled against God. And he tried to establish his own ownership on God's creation. That's where the devil went wrong. Right? Lucifer wanted to create and establish his own ownership over what was not his creation. Right, right there, and the Bible tells us right there in verse 12 that he was cast down to earth. So what happens is that Jesus, God, not Jesus, God, he implores angels to manage. And what happens is that the devil goes AWOL and God kicks him out to earth. Right there in Isaiah 14, 12, it tells us that he has been cast down to earth. So he kicks him out to earth, exiles him to earth. And the Bible tells us that Lucifer is able to convince a third of the angels to go with him. So a third of the angels go with him to earth. Right? He convinced a third of the angels that they could establish their own ownership on what they did not create. A lot of the, way, a lot of the same ways that the devil influences us to believe that we are owners over the things that we do not create or that we have not created. He does it. He plays the same game throughout all of history. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, and this is Jesus speaking, and this is to reify to, 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 so that you guys understand that Lucifer was kicked out of heaven and he was kicked down to earth. Jesus is speaking here on Luke 10, 18, and he says, He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Right? So he was there when Lucifer's name was changed to Satan. He was there when Satan became the rival to God. He was there when he got kicked out of heaven and to earth. Genesis 1-2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the word tells us that the earth was without order, that it was disorganized, right? It says that it was formless. You know what formless means? It means that it has no form. It means that there's no order. It says that it was empty. It contained nothing, and that darkness was over the surface of the deep. You know, and if you guys know, darkness is the absence of light. There was no light there. Right, but at some point in time, God, 
says, hey, so I, I want you to follow this. God <clears throat> is a manager that owns a property and it's called heaven. And Satan is living in that property. Satan blows it. Satan wants to be God, so he kicks him out of his property. He says, you know what? I'm going to kick you out of this property, but I have another property and it's called earth. You're going to go over there. You're, you can no longer be here. So he kicks uh, the devil to earth. Does that make sense? Okay, so he kicks the devil. So, so at some point in time, he says, you know what? I'm going to go back to earth and I'm going to go reclaim what is mine. So he does. He says, I'm going to go back and I'm going to fix and I'm going to restore what is mine. So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says that he introduces light and he separates it from darkness. The Bible tells us that he separates the seas from the land. The Bible tells us that he creates trees and vegetation, that he brings order to a formless earth. He brings light to a dark earth, and he fills an empty earth with land, with water, with vegetation, with animals, with moon, with the sun, with stars. But equally important, what God does is that he establishes new managers, and that's us, humankind. He goes back and he restores earth. He takes back what is his because it all belongs to God. Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 through 6 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them, that you have made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. Listen, if that doesn't sound like a manager, a description of a manager, I don't know what does. According to this verse, humans are a little lower than angels, right? We can't disappear. We can't fly. We can't just show up, right? Angels have that ability. We do not. We're a little lower than them. But the Bible says that he has crowned us with glory and honor to rule over his works. And don't get it twisted. He calls them his works because they're his and he owns them. Listen, that's stewardship. That is stewardship. You know, humans, we've been tasked to guard. We have been tasked to protect and to grow and to increase the belongings of our owner. Okay, it's not enough for you to protect them and to keep them from harm. You are to grow them and you are to increase them and you are to expand the assets that God has given you. Here's a definition of a steward. Another definition, it says a steward is someone entrusted with another's wealth or property and charged with the responsibility of managing it in the owner's best interest. A steward is entrusted with adequate resources and the authority to carry out his designated responsibilities. So here's the problem. Most of God's creation have misunderstood their roles because they think that they own what they've only been given to manage. So I don't know, a lot of you guys work and you probably work for companies. How many of you guys have ever worked in a company or in an environment where the owner and the manager have two different ideas on how the company should be ran? What do you find in that situation? Chaos. It's a chaotic environment. How many of you guys have ever worked in an environment where you got a boss and a manager that don't agree? Where the manager thinks he's the owner or knows that he thinks he, thinks he knows more than the owner? It creates a, cha a chaotic environment. It creates discord. What areas in your life do you have discord? Where are things not lining up in your life? Where do you have issues at? Well, maybe it's because the owner and the manager have competing ideas of what they should be doing. If there's any area in your life where there's discord, maybe it's because you as the manager are trying to tell the owner what you should do with his assets and with what he's given you. That's a good place to start if you find discord in your finances and in your relationships. Listen, and rightly so. If you're a manager, the owner's going to remind you that you work for them and that it's not the other way around. You know, and by that very same definition of stewardship, it says that we are provided the resources and tools that he or she will need to carry out their duties, right? So the Bible tells us that he made us in his image 
so that we could manage his creation. Look at in Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God has made us in his image to equip us to manage the things. So if you're here today and you're saying, man, I don't got what it takes to manage my family. I don't got what it takes to manage my life. Yes, you do. The Bible says you are made in his image, and you have all the tools and the resources that you need to be a good manager, a good steward. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 reads this, And the Lord God took the man, and he put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. To dress it and to keep it sounds like work. It sounds like something that a manager does. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So listen, according to this verse, verse 16 says that, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Over every tree of the garden thou mayest, mayest freely eat. Right? So God created man to be free. God created man to choose to have the freedom of choice, right? And when we look at all those other trees in the garden, what God is talking about, all those other trees were all of the things and the resources that God has put at your disposal to, so that you could get the most out of it to help you with God's will for your life. He wants you to max, maximize your potential of the garden that's there. Do you notice how he says you can eat from any tree, but you can't eat from this one? All the other trees represent all of the things that God has given you, your talents, your resources, your connections, your family, your genes. All of these things that God has given you and all of these resources at your fingertips, that's what those trees represent. But then he says, but of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, therefore thou shalt surely die. God wants you to get everything out of creation that it has the potential to provide you. <laughs> you know, have you ever wondered, like, why was that stinking tree even there anyways in the first place? Like, have you ever wondered why did God put the tree there? Well, let me give you some suggestions. One of them is that, you know what, God, God understands that we have to have a choice. Love is a choice. We have to have the opportunity to have a choice. In other words, I can't say that I love you if I don't have the option to not love you. Love is a choice, and God understands that. So the tree represents a choice. The second thing is, is because God doesn't want you and your basis of knowledge to be the knowledge that you have in your own reason. You know, when you think about that, what was so wrong with Adam and Eve wanting, in other words, what, what was wrong with their curiosity about this tree of knowledge? The Bible says it was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right? Sounds like the internet. <laughs> right? Where you can go and you can get all kinds of information on the internet. You want to fix your dryer? Boom. Go, go to YouTube DIY and boom, somebody will show you how to do it. You want to learn how to manage your finances? There is millions of, of websites and millions of videos that you can go and someone will show you how to manage your finances. There is a, a, a plethora of wealth and information on the internet. And that's what that tree represented. It represented Common knowledge. It represented what everybody else says you should do. It represented what, popular, what popularity and what's going on and what everybody else is doing. That's what that tree represented. And God says, listen, I don't want you eating from that tree because all of the knowledge that you have, I don't want it to be based on your own reason. If you could fix everything on your own reason, then why would you need God? He doesn't want you leaning on your own understanding when you're protecting and you're increasing his assets. He wants you to depend on the knowledge that he reveals to you. He wants you to depend on the knowledge that he speaks into your life, which is not conventional, it's not always convenient, and it's for sure not always popular. 
Listen, God does not want your thoughts competing with his thoughts while you are managing his assets. And let me tell you what his assets are. They're your life, your marriage, your children, your talent, your money, your time. All of that is his. And he does not want what you think competing with what he thinks when you're managing what he owns. And if you can understand that and if you can grasp that, your life is going to be revolutionized, I promise you. So let me give you a little side note. The only way God is ever going to reveal his plan to you in your life and the only thing new things are going to come about your life is when you create intimacy with God. God is not going to reveal anything new in your life and nothing new is going to pop off unless you are intimate with him. So let me give you an example. Husband and wife, right? Intimacy leads to pregnancy. Pregnancy develops something that is new, something that did not exist. If you want something new in your life and you want God to refresh things in your life, you need to get intimate with God. And what does that mean? It means that you need to spend time with him. You need to talk to him. You need to read your word. And you say, Vic, well, what do you mean? Look, at how do you spend time with your friends? How did you become friends with the person? Some of you have been working at a job for a year and you're already friends with the girl next door. How did that happen? Because you talk to them. Because you listen to them. And then you share how you feel about life and you tell them what you're worried about and you tell them, you know, what's going on and what's happy and what's going on. And, you know, I'm so excited. My kids, my son scored goals. And that's how you get to know somebody. You converse with them. You spend time with them. God is no different. And it doesn't have to be on your knees with your eyes closed praying. It could be while you're driving. Prayer can be a constant open conversation all day. Prayer doesn't have to be a set place or a set time with a set, a set way. You, you can talk to God all day in your mind. You talk to yourself anyways. You're doing it right now. You're talking to yourself as I'm talking to you. Instead of talking to yourself, talk to God. Tell God how you feel. Tell God what's worrying you. Tell God what's angering you. He cares. Tell him. So listen, the utter confusion that you see in today's world is because people are living their lives based on their own ability to reason. You know, a lot of people live their lives based on what they know and who they know. And that's it. Rather than the revealed will of God. So listen, he puts the tree there to remind them and to remind us that he's the owner. And you, you human, you're just the manager. It's mine, he says. So check this out. The same way that God gives us the freedom to manage his creation, he gives us the freedom to mess it up. Not only to mess it up, but to give it up as well. In Luke 4, Jesus and Satan are having a conversation. And I'm going to show you how Adam gave it up. Luke 4 Five through seven, the devil let, reads this. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So hold up for a second. This is the devil talking, and he's saying that I will give you the authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So how can the devil be offering the kingdoms of the world, right, of earth, and how does he say that it's been given to him, and that I can give it to anyone that I want if all of it belongs to God? How can that be? Well, listen, God entrusted Adam, and Adam gave it back to the devil. Adam's decision to eat of that tree, he decided to relinquish ownership, I mean management, and he gave it back to the devil, and nothing has changed. Many of us are like Adam, and we have forfeited our management over the things that God has given us. Maybe not all things, but we've forfeited our management over certain areas, you know, it's like owning a home. <clears throat> How many of you guys own your home? Right? But who actually owns your home? <clears throat> the bank owns your home. You stop making that payment, they will come and take your home from you. <laughs> so you own the home, you manage the home. The bank owns the home. Right? And the bank gives you the free trash your home. Some of you guys have neighbors that, that uh, exemplify this. 
they don't cut their grass. They, don't, they haven't painted their house in 40 years. They, they, they're not good stewards of their home. They're not good managers of their home. But you know what? The bank allows them to be bad managers. Even though they claim ownership over the home. God is the same way with us. You know, God gives us enough freedom to trash what he has entrusted us with. We have the freedom to mess up our lives. We have the freedom to mess up our families. We have the freedom to mess up our world. Listen, God has given you the freedom to be a bad manager. The same way that he gives us the ability to be great managers and to be stewards over all the things that he's given us, he gives us the freedom to throw it all away. And not only throw it all away, but to give it away to the devil. Listen, the biblical doctrine of stewardship, listen, what it does is that it defines the relationship between you and God, between man, humankind, and God. And this is what it establishes. It identifies God as the owner and you as the manager. That's what stewardship does. That's the biblical doctrine of stewardship. He owns it, you manage it. You know, and more often than not, when we think of good stewardship, we always think about money, managing our finances, right? With our tithes and our offering. But as you can see, it's much more than that. In fact, we always start with money, right? And today we're talking about that it's not just money, but it's everything that God has given us. But listen, it goes even deeper than that. It's more than just the management of our time and our possessions and our environment or our health. Stewardship is the obedient witness to God's supremacy. It's you realizing that you're underneath someone that's greater than you. Stewardship starts there. Stewardship defines our practical obedience, right? It's the things that we practically do and how we administer, how we apply those things every day over the things that we're in control over. It's the dedication of oneself and possessions to God's purpose. Right? Stewardship acknowledges in practice that we do not have the right of control over ourselves or our property, but God does. In Matthew 25, we find a perfect illustration of stewardship. And I'm going to read the passage. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it in increments, and I'm just going to stop, and I'm going to comment on it. And uh, this is a common verse, a uh, uh, little passage that's been used to, to uh, illustrate stewardship. So let's read it. Matthew 25, 14, 30. And this is what it starts at 14. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So a man going on a journey, right? This is the, the, the analogy is this is God, Jesus. Jesus is going to go away, right? And he's going to go on this trip, but he's coming back. And, and who called his servants, right? We're his servants. And entrusted his wealth. And I want you to realize there, it says his servants and entrusted his wealth. Did everybody catch that? All right, because it's his. 15 says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. That's super important that you understand that. God blessed them according to their ability. And we'll talk about that more. Then he went on his journey. So listen, a rich man assigns the management of his wealth to his servants. Right? A lot of investors do that today, right? They, they, they uh, take their, their money and they have investors put their money where they want it so that they can make more money. Right, so he gives five talents, which is a large amount of money in that day to the first servant. It tells us that he gives two to the second, and then he gives one to the third. Verse 16, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. So two of the servants, right? There's two out of three. Two of the servants go and they earn 100% return by trading the funds, right? So one had five. He went and made five more. The other one had two. He had two more. That's 100% profit. And the other one had one. He went and dug it in a hole. And he comes back and he earns nothing. He just has what he was given. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. You know, the Bible tells us that one day Jesus is coming back. And he's been gone a long time. 
The Bible says it's a long journey. Well, he's been gone a long time, and he's coming back to settle accounts. Verse 20, the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Verse 22, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things, and I will put you in many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, and he said, master, he said, I, I, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. You see, this third steward, like many Christians, are overwhelmed by the weight of what God's task has put on us, right? And we put off contributing anything to it, right? The master replies on the behalf, <clears throat> on, the, on, on the belief that I am indeed hard and merciless, you should have been more diligent. You know, so this guy, the third guy, he, he starts off with making excuses right away. He says, you know, I, I knew you to be a hard man. Basically saying, I knew, you, I knew you were a tough guy. I knew you were mean. So I didn't want to mess up, so I went and hid your stuff. And, you know, a lot of us have a misunderstanding of God, and we think that God is like that, like the way this guy anticipated his, his mastery to be. You know, the other servants are rewarded by the master's desire to do good. Fearing that the master's harshness, but unaware of his good nature, experiences the wrath that he feared. Right? The other, the, other, the other servants were rewarded by the master's desire to do good, but this servant was fearing the harshness, but was unaware of his master's good nature. Wasn't aware of his good intentions. So he was afraid of him, but basically, he, he basically creates exactly what he was afraid of in this master. He experiences the very wrath that he was afraid of. Right? He didn't want to disappoint this guy, but what does he end up doing? He ends up disappointing the guy. So I, I want to point out a couple things in this verse. And, and the, the, one, the first one is that equal worth does not necessarily mean equal compensation. I want you guys to understand that, you know, both of these guys, they both were compensated differently. One made five, one made two, and one made none. But I want you to understand that it, it doesn't, equal worth doesn't necessarily mean equal compensation. The two servants that did well were rewarded in different amounts, but they were praised exactly the same. What does he say? Well done, good and faithful servant. He says it to both of them. So even though the reward was different, the praise was identical. And I want you to understand that because a lot of the times we think that we're not important enough or that God doesn't see us. We don't have enough to give. I don't have enough talent. I don't know how to sing. I don't know how to listen. God gives you according to your ability and he praises everybody the same, regardless of what the compensation is. Listen, some positions require more skill, and they require more ability, and that's why people get paid more. And rightfully so. In verse 26, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. You know, the rich man returns, and he rewards the two who made money, but he severely punishes the servant who did nothing. And he tells him, hey, bro, if you were so afraid of me, you should have at least took that money and invested it in the bank. Well, I would have at least had some interest when I came back. 28, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. Listen, when you're a good steward and when you do well with what God has given you, God gives you more. You notice how he gives the one bag to the guy with the five? Because the five guy, the guy that earned five, earned five more, can now handle six. When we're good stewards with the little that God has given us, God will always give us more. For, who has, for, whoever, has, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
You know, this parable extends far beyond any type of financial investment. A lot of people think that this guy gets punished because he didn't make enough money. You're missing the point. Right? God has given each person a variety of gifts, and he expects us to use those gifts for his purpose and for his glory. And it's not acceptable to put those gifts that he's given you on a shelf or ignore them. Like the three servants, we do not have gifts at the same degree. Right? Some of us have more gifts than others. Some of us have other gifts and talented in other areas. But we do not all have the same degree of gift. The return that God expects from us is proportionate with the gifts that he's given you. God understands what he's given you, and he's going to expect accordingly to what he's given you. So listen, the servant who received one talent was not condemned for failing to reach the five gold talent. He was condemned because he did nothing with what he was given. You know, the gifts that we receive from God, they include our skills. They include our abilities. They include our family. It includes our connections, our social positions, our education, our experiences, and so much more. Listen, the point of the parable is that we are to use whatever we've been given for God's purposes. God wants us to invest our life, not waste them. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the wisdom, Lord, that it, uh, that it gives us, God. And today, Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we studied, Lord, I pray, Lord, that uh, the definition of a steward, Lord, the idea of what a steward and what a good manager is, Lord, would be clear. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that we would all have a desire to be good stewards, Lord, of the things that you've given us, Lord. Not only our money, Lord, but I pray, Lord, that we would be good stewards of our time. I pray that we would be good stewards of our talent, Lord, and the resources. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that we would all, because we all fail and we all lose sight and we lose track, but that we would recognize that all things belong to you, that you are the owner of all things, Lord. You created us. You own our life. Everything that we have, God, we owe to you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that today, Lord, that we would make the most of what is available to us, Lord. I pray, God, Lord, that we would seek, Lord, that we would ask for wisdom, Lord, that you would open our eyes, Lord. Some of us don't realize the resources that are at our fingertips. We don't realize, Lord, the things that we're not using, that we're not employing. Lord, I pray today, God, Lord, that you would, in your mercy, Lord, in your grace, Lord, in the love that you have for us, Lord, that you would show us those that have the desire to know. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that when we do, Lord, I pray, Lord, that those gifts, that those talents, that those resources that you've given us, Lord, that we would always use them, Lord, for your glory, Lord, and for your honor, Lord. That we would use them, Lord, to fulfill, Lord, the purpose that you've planned for our life, Lord, the perfect will that you have for our life. So today, Lord, I pray, God, Lord, that as we go about our day, Lord, as we go about our life, Lord, that we would always keep the mentality of a steward, Lord, that we are managers, Lord, over all the things that you've given us, Lord, that we own nothing, not even our own life, Lord. All of it, Lord, we owe to you. Lord, you paid a heavy price for our life. And today, Lord, I, I'm thankful for that. So today, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. We're thankful for all that you're doing here at Living Word and what you're going to continue to do, Lord, in the lives of your people. We thank you, and we ask in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Listen, thank you guys for being a wonderful audience. It's always a privilege and an honor to lead you guys in... Uh, God's word. So we'll see you guys on Sunday. Again, if you guys want to give, there's boxes. You can do it online or you can come here during the week. Love you guys and we'll see you on Sunday. You guys are dismissed.